Hi, my name is Benjamin Jerry Cohen. I teach in the Political Science Department at University of California, Santa Barbara. And today I'd like to talk with you about the subject of currency war. How do national currencies compete? This really breaks down into two significant questions. Do currencies, in fact, compete? And secondly, if they compete, do they go to war? Uh, are there severe policy conflicts that lead to uh, severe differences of opinion? We'll address these questions as we go along. Uh, but to start, I need to introduce you to three preliminary issues. The first issue is, what is a currency? Second, what is a national currency? And third, what is the international monetary system? Just a few words on each of these. A currency. Currency is a synonym for money. And how do we define money? We define money by certain functions uh, that can be performed by money. These three functions are medium of exchange, unit of account, and store of value. Anything that serves these three functions is money. Monies are not necessarily limited only to national currencies, but national currencies which I will explain in a moment, uh, are uh, the dominant form of money. But anything that serves these three functions. Medium of exchange. Medium of exchange simply means that this is a medium, a vehicle, that I can exchange for goods and services. If I sell goods and services, I will receive this money, this medium, which I can then use subsequently to buy goods and services from others. Unit of account. Unit of account means simply that money serves as a yardstick to tell us the relative, val relative cost, the relative price of various things that are, being, that are being bought and sold. Notice I said price, not value. Value and price are not exactly the same thing. Every beginning student in economics, and I began life as an economist, every student of economics is taught the diamond water paradox. The paradox that diamonds cost so much more, they have such a high price relative to water, at least in most parts of the world other than Death Valley. The, um, uh, the price of water is so much lower, the price of diamonds is so much higher, yet from the point of view of what we need to live, we need water to live. That has a very high value. We don't really need diamonds though my wife might disagree about that, I suppose. Uh, the, um, uh, we don't need diamonds, yet their price is much higher. The answer to this paradox is simple. It's a matter of scarcity, relative scarcity. Diamonds are scarce. Water is, mo in many places, most places, abundant enough to live on. Uh, and that makes the difference in price. Things that are scarce tend to be high in price. Things that are low, uh, that are, are abundant, tend to have a low price. And then finally, in addition to medium exchange, unit of account, we also have store of value. Money is a store of value. If I sell you a good or a service and I receive this medium of exchange in return, I expect it to, to remain valuable, to retain purchasing power that I can use in the future. And that is what we mean by store of value. It's a stored up amount of purchasing power. The second thing we need to just mention, national currency. As I said, there are many things that can perform the functions of money. But the dominant form of money is what we call national money, money that is issued by a government, specifically by the National Monetary Authority, or what we call a central bank. In the United States, that's the Federal Reserve. In Britain, it's the Bank of England. In Japan, it's the Bank of Japan. In China, it's the People's Bank of China, and so on. A government issues a national money, and it does everything it can through various kinds of laws and regulations to ensure that its money retains a monopoly within the borders, the territorial frontiers, of the state, of the government's nation. The, um, uh, the idea is that the government will have a monopoly over the supply of money 
uh, over time. So what is the international monetary system? Well, we live in a world of sovereign states, a world in which world politics is, uh, is divided up into a series of sovereign states, almost 200 sovereign states in the world today. These states, each, most of them, try to maintain a monopoly in terms of their own national money within the frontiers of their uh, uh, territory. They try to be the monopoly supplier and manager of the money supply. But that means that there's no higher authority over them. Instead, what we have is a system in which we have a large number of individual monopolies. That's what um, uh, we mean by the international monetary system. Now, just a word about myself. I uh, teach in the political science department, as I said, here at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I began life as an economist, but then uh, as uh, time passed, I realized that I was really much more interested in the politics of economics and not conventional economics. And I began to specialize in the political economy of money and finance, of international money and finance. Very early on, it seemed to me, it came to me that the basic problem of the international monetary system, this collection of national monetary monopolies, the basic problem is that there is a tension between two things. On the one hand, we all have a collective interest in having a stable and efficient international monetary system. An international monetary system is like the, the lubricant that keeps the wheels of commerce moving. But on the other hand, that's the economics of it. But on the other hand, we also have the politics of it the politics of separate sovereign states, each with their own national monetary monopoly. And those states will not necessarily agree on what best serves their interests. And so we have this tension between the collective interest in a smoothly functioning monetary system and the potential for conflict of interest between the various governments uh, that uh, create and manage a separate national money. I've, in, in, over time, I've written about a number of subjects under this gen, about, that embody this general tension. Subjects like exchange rates, currencies, financial markets, debt, there are others, sovereign wealth funds, and so on. My aim, I can't comment on impact, but my aim has been to try to gain more understanding of how that tension can be managed, that tension between our collective interest and the individual interest, the potential for conflict among the individual in, in interests of countries. This is just a, a sample of books that I have written over the years that touch on one or another aspect of that. Now, we have two basic questions, two basic questions. How do currencies compete, and can currency conflict be avoided? Can currency war be avoided? I have here on the slide uh, the two possible outcomes. On the left is, what is the sort of thing that can happen if we don't manage the potential for conflict, if we don't somehow find a way to avoid currency conflict. Uh, it's a headline. In, from September 1929, when the stock market crashed and the Great Depression began. But there's also the other possibility that somehow conflict can be avoided. The best example of that took place in 1944, the next to last year of the Second World War, when all of the Allied nations, there were 44 of them led by the United States and Britain, uh, gathered together Representatives gathered together at a small resort town in northern New Hampshire called Bretton Woods. In this hotel, this hotel called the Mount Washington Hotel, in the background you can see Mount Washington itself, the highest peak in the White Mountains of North New Hampshire. And at that conference at Bretton Woods in 1944, 
governments settled on the rules that would govern the international monetary system in the period after the end of the war. That was a, an example of successful avoidance of conflict. So, two questions. Start with, how can there be competition between currencies if each one of them is a monopoly? And the answer, obviously, is that there are all, each of them is only a monopoly within its own borders. But, the, but they can compete across borders. And that's where currency competition comes in. Now, there are two forms of currency competition, what we call currency substitution and what we call currency internationalization. Currency substitution is what happens when a country like, let's call it Peru, um, experiences a high rate of inflation, people become suspicious about the uh, value of the national currency, the Peruvian peso, and so they begin to look for an alternative to substitute for their own national currency. In Peru, that would probably be the dollar, which is why we call this process of currency substitution dollarization. Uh, there may be other currencies that are used in this way, but the, the bulk of it is done in the U.S. dollar. Currency internationalization is different. Currency substitution is one currency substituting for another for domestic purposes within a country like Peru. Uh, but we also have currency internationalization. What is that? That's the process by which certain currencies, national currencies, come to be used for international purposes. What's that all about? Well, the point is very simple. If each country has a legal monopoly uh, within its own borders, then there's no global currency that can be used for transactions between national monetary uh, monopolies. There's no world central bank. Uh, there's no world currency. So instead, certain national currencies come to be used for international purposes, come to be used to settle trade transactions, to make international investments, to transfer remittances from uh, uh, one member of a family who migrated to others who are still back home. Currency internationalization is the process of uh, uh, Ad adoption for international use, and there can be competition between the currencies that are used for this purpose. Both, both of these processes, currency substitution and currency internationalization, are driven by demand, by market preferences, by the preferences of all the many people who have, an, uh, have to be engaged in monetary transactions, whether domestically or internationally. Governments cannot force people in other countries to use their currency. The U.S. government, however popular the U.S. dollar is, the U.S. government cannot force people in Peru or anywhere else in the world to use the U.S. dollar. The U.S. government can try to make the dollar attractive so that it might be more popular, but it's the people who use currency, the demand side of the market, it's those people who determine what currencies will be uh, substituted, what currencies will be internationalized. So let's talk a little about currency substitution. Currency substitution, as I said, involves extensive use within the borders of a country like Peru, extensive use of a popular foreign currency which many residents prefer to the local currency. That's what we mean by currency substitution. In effect, it's the equivalent of a powerful or strong currency invading the territory of a country with a weak currency. And we have many examples of that. It goes on around the world. It goes on in Latin America, in the Middle East, in Central Asia, parts of Africa, uh, 
Southeast Asia, the Balkans. We have many examples of, uh, of, of this process by which residents in a country begin to express a preference for a foreign currency rather their own, than their own domestic currency. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? They do it because the local currency, for one reason or another, becomes suspect. Uh, the most obvious uh, uh, problem has to do with inflation. Governments have to have money when they want to spend um, things on uh, goods and services and the like. Governments can raise taxes in order to have money to spend, or they can borrow. But if they have reached a limit on how much they can raise in taxes, and if they've reached a limit on how much they can borrow, there is one other alternative. If they have a national monetary monopoly, they can create more money. They can simply run the printing press. We call it the printing press method of monetary management. Governments have that right if they have a monopoly over the money supply. They have that ability, that capacity. But if they abuse it, if they spend too much money, if they create too much money, that's going to be a situation of too much money chasing too few goods, and the result will be inflation. Inflation means the money becomes less valuable. The purchasing power embodied in the money declines. And so residents naturally then look to a popular foreign currency, which will have more stable value. In the Western Hemisphere, that would be the dollar. In the European area or Africa, it might be the euro, the common currency of the European Union. That's the principal reason why currency substitution takes place, because of the fact that the local currency is losing purchasing power due to inflation. Now, what we then have is a situation in which some currencies gain in the competition. Those are the currencies that we think of as the main currencies, the big international currencies. Um, other currencies lose uh, their um, uh, attraction uh, and uh, begin to uh, uh, fail. If we take the population of national currencies in the world as a whole, that amounts to a, what I have called the currency pyramid. At the very top, the most powerful currencies like the US dollar, or the euro, Japanese yen, British pound, Swiss franc, and then down through the pyramid, currencies that are weaker and weaker, to currencies at the bottom that are regarded by the market as simply junk currencies. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Why, why would a local government be concerned about currency substitution? Why would it not simply say, go ahead, go ahead, uh, just use the dollar instead of the local peso? There are three big losses that are involved. The government experiences three significant losses. The first one is that it loses control over monetary policy. It's a familiar fact that if a government wants to uh, try to manage the overall performance of the national economy, it only has two instruments, what we call monetary policy, what we call fiscal policy. Monetary policy is the management of the money supply and its price, which of course is the interest rate. Uh, fiscal policy is the government's own budget, the level of taxes, the level of spending by the government. You have undoubtedly uh, heard at one time or another of how important the Federal Reserve is to the management of the U.S. economy. That's because the Federal Reserve has the ultimate authority over the supply of dollars and the interest rates that are charged on those dollars. If currency substitution takes place, then we have a situation in which the government can no longer manage the money supply because the money supply is created by a foreign central bank, the Federal Reserve, rather than by the local central bank, the Central Bank of Peru. So 
that's a big loss from the point of view of a national government to lose one of the two main instruments for the management of the economy. Secondly, there's a loss of what we call seniorage. Seniorage is, the, um, is an old Latin-based word for the, uh, the fact that whoever creates money benefits because it doesn't cost that much to create money, but you can buy a lot of valuable goods and services with that money. That's what we call seniorage. My, my phrase for it is that you can, you can make a lot of money by making money. A government that uh, no longer controls the national money supply because of currency substitution is a government that loses the seniorage. And thirdly, governments lose a symbol of national identity. These are important. Cultural anthropologists have taught us how important it is for governments uh, to uh, cultivate a, a, a patriotism, to cultivate a love of country through the use of various symbols, uh, a flag, a national anthem, national sports teams, postage stamps, and money. Money is an important symbol of national identity, which is lost if currency substitution takes place. What can the local government do? One thing the local government can do is to simply give up. We've been invaded. Uh, we can't uh, resist, so we'll give up, and we'll just adopt the popular foreign currency. Believe it or not, there are a number of countries that have done that, including Ecuador in the year 2000, including uh, El Salvador a year later, uh, Zimbabwe more recently. There are a number of countries that have done this, have simply given up on trying to pro provide a national currency, and they have surrendered, in effect, their monetary sovereignty to someone else. Um, you, as you can understand, as you can anticipate, most governments are resistant to that. So the examples of what we call formal dollarization are, are quite small, uh, quite few. Another possibility is to form a monetary union, a monetary alliance. Just as in war, you can ha gain strength by having an alliance rather than fighting on your own. Governments might form a currency union. That doesn't involve a surrender of monetary sovereignty, as does the first choice, but it does involve uh, a subordination, a, a, a sharing of sovereignty, uh, which may be very uncomfortable for some governments. There have been many, many governments around the world that have talked about the possibility of a monetary union. I was personally involved in one attempt in Latin America uh, among Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay, I asked them, what, what name would you give your currency? Because, you know, Brazil speaks Portuguese, Argentina and the others speak Spanish. They said, well, one of the few words we share in common is gaucho. And I, my students here at UCSB are always amused by that, since our sports teams are named the gauchos. The, um, but that, uh, that option, the alliance option, is also uh, and not used very often because of the fact that it means giving up part of your sovereignty. The last is to do everything you can to defend the, your currency, and that is what governments have generally chosen to do. Fifteen or twenty years ago, there was a great debate among economists about whether currency substitution was going to lead to the elimination of a lot of so-called junk currencies. Um, that's the reason why I have this uh, cartoon on the... Uh, slide. Um, and people talked about the money supply, uh, global money supply, number of monies uh, being reduced significantly, contracting. I call that the contraction contention. Um, it turns out that most governments have chosen the defense option. Now, what about currency internationalization? Currency internationalization is not a case like currency substitution of a strong currency invading a weak currency. Rather, currency internationalization and the risk of conflict uh, among them has to do with the fact that we're talking about strong currency versus strong currency. They compete with one another for popularity. Uh, the, um, uh, I've already explained why we need to have national currencies internationalized because of the fact that we don't have a global currency. We have to have these national currencies to perform international functions. 
which is the same currencies that are popular for substitution, the US dollar, the euro, and a small handful of others. I've listed here the main attributes that make a currency popular uh, for international purposes. First of all, the, the issuer has to be a, a big economy. You wouldn't expect the currency of, um, uh, of some small uh, country like, um, shall we say, Thailand uh, to become internationalized. Uh, but we would expect the currency of a country as big as the United States uh, to become internationalized. Uh, secondly, uh, there must be a, a well-developed financial market because of the store value function. People are not going to accept your currency for an international transaction if they have no assurance that it will retain its value uh, or that it could even be profitably invested. Foreign policy ties and military reach are political considerations that make some currencies more popular than others. Effective governance is extremely important. Uh, people are not going to uh, use an, a, a currency for international purposes that is not managed well. Must competition among international currencies result in conflict, in war? No. The answer is no. We have examples of countries whose currencies have become popular internationally, and yet they did nothing to try to promote that. That was true of West Germany back before the days of the euro, the introduction of the euro. That was true of West Germany, whose Deutschmark was very popular in Europe and some other parts of the world, but West German government did nothing to promote it. The same was true of Japan after World War II, when its currency, when the when its economy recovered and its currency, the yen, became very popular. Um, but it can happen. And the biggest risk, of course, is the, the risk of a conflict between the United States and China, because China has made no secret of the fact that it wants to compete with the dollar uh, for um, uh, international purposes. So, bottom line. Currency competition is natural. It occurs in the form of both currency substitution and currency internationalization. But currency war can be avoided under circum cer certain circumstances. We can have a Bretton Woods outcome rather than a Great Depression outcome. But it all depends on the, the politics of negotiation among sovereign governments. Thank you very much for your attention.